In this episode of the Houndsman XP podcast, we have coon dogs, squirrel dogs, and just some good down home Appalachian Mountain living coming at you with Kenny and Melissa Nash. They have been great fans and supporters of the Houndsman XP podcast, and we wanted to feature them on an, their very own episode. And uh, we talk about marriage advice, marital advice, how to achieve marital bliss. That's some added bonus material for you. So, hey, Kenny and Melissa did a uh, did us a real good good solid here by agreeing to come on the podcast and just tell their story. And that's what this podcast is all about: is telling stories. And it doesn't matter whether you're the most well known houndsman in the history of our uh, sport, or if you are just a person that's out there getting after it every day and trying to make your difference and leave your mark and make a difference in this community. So, hey, glad to have Melissa and Kenny Nash on. Also, don't forget to contact us. Reach out. Send us a message. Let us know how we're doing so that we can continue to improve for you. So, hey, like I said, thanks for tuning in. I think you'll enjoy this episode. Have fun. Welcome to the Houndsman XP Podcast, everybody, and tonight we are sitting down with Melissa and Kenny Nash from Maryland, and uh, you know, the, the great thing about sitting down with and talking to uh, people like Melissa and Kenny is uh, I really enjoy, I really have enjoyed you guys and, and the support you've given the podcast, for one thing, so th- thanks for being with us, and uh Thanks for your support since we started. You guys have been great, big, huge fans, and I've, I've, I'm glad we you guys agreed to come on the podcast. Yeah, we we really enjoy listening to it. There's been a lot of good information on there. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, you know, the thing that we're trying to do is is uh, everybody has a story. Everybody, if, if we look around hard enough at our hound hunting community, it's not that big anyway, and – Everybody has a story, and that's what we want to do is if we're truly going to build unity in this in this community that we have in the hound hunting community, then it always goes a lot better when when we get to know everybody as many people as we can anyway so just kind of tell us where you guys are from and and um just introduce us to Melissa and Kenny Nash mm-hmm. all right well um we live in Grantsville, Maryland now um I'm originally not too far from there just a little bit east of there and uh we've got blue tick coon hounds that we run on coon we've got a mountain feist that we hunt on squirrel and then uh we also have a chocolate lab he's our old waterfowl buddy uh, but we just i don't know we just enjoy a whole outdoor lifestyle yeah and uh i'll let kenny tell you a little bit about himself <laughs> well i'm from queen's county uh, what we would call the eastern shore um on the other side of the bay. Uh, All right, so you're from the eastern. Kenny, you say you're from the eastern shore. Describe what the eastern shore is, because I'm I'm not from Maryland and I don't know what the eastern shore is. So what is that? Um, it's the Delmarva Peninsula. If I'm saying it right. <laughs> um, it's uh on the east side of what we'd call the Bay Bridge. It's like a four or five mile long bridge. Um, a bunch of like marshland, sandy soil type stuff. Okay. Uh. Seek a deer? You know, uh, I've seen them. I've been close to them. I've never hunted them. Yep. Um, I hear they taste great, and they're, they're fun to hunt. Uh, they call out like elk, right. from my understanding. Right. But that I'm not too familiar with either one. <laughs> that area right there is where you would find Seekas, though, isn't it? Yeah, south of me. Okay. I could probably drive within an hour, an hour and a half, and you know, be able to hunt them. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're living where now, where are you at now? Grantsville, Maryland. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, we're stones throw from West Virginia. <laughs> I got you. So yeah, we're, that's right. Right. Where Maryland gets skinny on the Western side. We're sandwiched between West Virginia and Pennsylvania. I got you. All right. So you guys are actually in the mountains then. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that's pretty cool, pretty cool stuff right there. How, so describe, kind of describe your terrain. Describe a Maryland mountain, because I'm telling you what, most people I don't think 
would even consider, I didn't, you know, consider Maryland uh, part of the Appalachian chain or, or anything like that. And, and until I started following you on social media and having some conversations with you guys about where you live. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty much just the very Western part of the state that's, you know, up in the mountains, uh, where we live, we're about 2,900 feet elevation. Um, kind of the cool thing about here is we're right on the Eastern continental divide. So at our house, the water from here flows actually into the Mississippi river. If you go up over the mountain, just a mile or two, it's flowing east into the Chesapeake Bay and Atlantic ocean. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're kind of, you know, right there on that Eastern continental divide. Yeah. Uh, but it's, you know, to somebody out, out West, they would probably call this more, you know, rolling hills. <laughs> uh, you know, the Appalachians are older mountains, so right. they're, you know, they're kind of, they're not as, as big as, you know, what you'd see if you went out to like Colorado or California, but, right. um, you know, certainly, certainly for the East coast, you know, we're, we're up in there. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys are hunt old cold country, <laughs> old cold country. Yeah. All those Appalachian yeah. mountains for sure. They sure are fed a lot of families off those, those coal mines. That's. That's one thing. So you guys are hunting blue ticks. Tell me, you guys coon hunt, you squirrel hunt. Tell me what you guys enjoy doing. So what's a, typ um, what's a typical yeah. day for the Nashes? <laughs> well, work, really, a typical day. Mm -hmm. um, this time of year, you know, we're actually just now starting into leaf out here. So we don't have a whole lot of leaves on the trees yet. So we've really been, been focusing on Joker, our, our squirrel dog. Um, you know, trying to get him out after some more squirrels here before the, the leaves get real thick. Um, so, you know, this spring we've kind of been turkey hunting and mushroom hunting and digging ramps and, uh, we're going to get in, know, we are definitely going to get into some ramp talk. That's for sure. That is one of the okay. things <laughs> on the list that we're going to talk about. Um, you guys spend a lot of time. The thing, the reason I wanted to have you on the podcast is because it seems like you spend a lot of time together and I, and we had Cleveland Becky Dwyer on the podcast, uh, last year. And we like to celebrate and talk about these husband and wife outdoor teams because I think it's very important. And, and, uh, do you guys hunt with anybody else or do you ex pretty much exclusively hunt together? Um, sometimes. Occasionally. Yeah, occasionally, but most of the time we're, we're hunting, you know, together with each other. Um, but we, you know, we both, you know, hunted and fished before we met the, the coon hunting, we kind of got in together. Um, we got married in 2012 and we decided we wanted to go on a hunt for our honeymoon and, you know, we couldn't afford a, you know, a big fancy hunt for two people. So we decided, well, we're going to go on a hog hunt. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that was something that was, that was doable. And, uh, we went to. I can't remember the guy's name now, but it was a, a guide in Georgia that did hog hunts with dogs. Yep. And uh, we had had our, our lab that we waterfowl hunted with, but that hog hunt was our very first experience with any kind of tracking dog, really. Um, we ended up not being successful. We had one one close call, but uh, but it got away from us. But that's, that's what really got us into the, the dog hunting. And uh, about a year after that, you know, we got our we got our first coon hound, and just kind of expanded from there. So, so tell me about your first experience with a coon hound. What was what was your? Uh, do you still have the same hound? We do. She's really old now. <laughs> we we call her our old lady, um, but she she kind of earned her place in in retirement. Um, a guy that Kenny used to work with, actually, you know, we started going with him just to kind of you know, check it out and everything. And, uh, just to tag along. Yeah. Yeah. Just tagging along. We didn't even have a dog. We didn't have lights. You know, we're out there walking around with like a, a mag light and, you know, not, not really prepared at all, but, um, for, for just getting started. Um, and then we got this dog and just, and just started hunting her and, um, you know, she wasn't any kind of ball of fire or anything, but she, she definitely got us started and, and the interest was there. And then, uh, that following year we bought a, a pup to start on our own. So, okay. So how, how was she when you got her? Got into. How, how, did, how was the dog when you got her? How old? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, she was probably about five, maybe, because she's 12 now. Okay. So she um, would have been a broke dog then. And she, yeah, mm. more or less. <laughs> she, she had her yeah. issues. Okay. I, got, she was, I know exactly she what was, you're saying. She was, she was shy and, you know, and, and timid and, and, you Didn't know. Didn't like I, men. I think, yeah. At some point in her life, I think somebody had not been very good to her. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we, we worked with her, you know, we didn't really know what we were doing. We were just kind of trial and error and just taking her out to the woods. And, you know, eventually we got her, we got her hunting pretty good. And do you feel like, do you feel like the, uh, who was teaching who in this thing? That's what I want to know. If you're new, she's new or, you know, <sighs> she's new to you. You guys don't have a lot of experience with, with hounds. Do you guys feel like that uh, she probably helped you learn as much as you helped her? Oh yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and that's I mean she she's earned her place here. She's you know she's kind of I think she's starting to get hard of you know hard of seeing. Um, I don't. She acts like she's hard of hearing, but um, the the jury's still out on that. My wife says that about me <laughs> but, too. Uh, yeah, I've, I've faked it for a lot of I faked it for a lot of years, and then I had to break down and get hearing aids this year because I actually was. But uh, yeah, I, I yeah. get it. Once you start getting older, things start going south on you. It's all right. And we we still take her out, <laughs> you know, once once or twice a year. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't really have the drive anymore. We actually call her Me Too these days because she's figured out that she'll let the younger dogs do the work, and then she'll run into the tree. <laughs> That's like Roxy. You guys, have you guys seen Roxy on on my posts? Uh, I've heard you talk about yeah, her. Yeah, Roxy the rig dog. She's a boxer. Um, yeah. She uh, she rides with me. She's the one licking the grill utensils. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she's clean. She's clean up dogs. She's rig dog. She's a house dog. She's a uh, coyote decoy dog. She's actually multi talented. <laughs> she she does a lot of cool stuff. But uh, that's one thing that she does too, Melissa. Is she acts like she's a coon dog. And she'll run out there. What she wants to go every night, and then once the dog's tree, then she'll she'll make sure she's there. I won't see her again. When I start walking, she'll just disappear, and she'll be at the tree waiting on me, like she was there the whole time. Yeah, yeah. She's definitely uh, she's definitely tired after the first tree. I mean, she's <laughs> she's a one tree dog anymore. Yeah, she she has the heart, just not the body anymore. Oh, uh, no, yep, yep. So. Uh, Tell us where you guys went from there. You got this older dog. Now you're, I, I know you've done some competition hunting, you know, things like that. Tell us where, how your, how your hunting career has, has progressed. Yeah. So we, yeah, we had had midnight, the older dog. We had had her for, for about a year. Um, we had gotten hooked up with some of the guys at our local coon club. Um, at the time we only lived about a mile and a half from the club. We didn't even know it was there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, our, our, we're staying on the front. We were staying on the front porch, and uh, I remember specifically one day, and I just kept seeing dog box after dog box going up the road, and I was like, "Hey, uh, hun, um, didn't your dad say there's a coon club up the road?" And <laughs> I think he said that like it, it had folded years ago or something like that, and uh, so we decided to ride up there and explore. And uh, them guys were them them guys and girls up there were you know, real appreciative that we, we wanted to be involved and we asked for memberships right away and asked, you know, you know, about everything with it. They took us out spectating and everything. They, they really helped us out with that. That's good stuff. They got us started. So you, you went to a club, didn't know anybody there and you're pretty much welcome, welcome with open arms. Oh yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And how valuable, how valuable was that for you as uh, new new houndsmen, new hunters. Uh, how how valuable it was that relationship? How you know what it was it turned into for you? Well, they're the ones. They're the ones that really showed us what a competition dog should look like, or at least we got us started on it. But like we our, our first hunt, we realized like midnight, our old dog like. We we needed something younger, a little bit more quicker, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, they they would take us out, and uh, we would do like mock hunts, you know, just like buddy hunts. And they would show us how the scoring system works, and you know how like you know all the rules. They they really mentored us, and they really I think that really got us going 
on an early pass. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, and like like Kenny said, they you know they were willing to let us go out and spectate, and that that first hunt that we spectated on, we still talk about it to this day. It is the best sportsmanship we've ever seen in a cast. <laughs> uh, I think we scored on six or seven coon that night, and nobody spotted their own coon. You know, everybody was, you know, dogs were splitting on pretty much every tree, and it was always somebody else that found that guy's coon. Um, and just, you know, you know, you know being on, on a bunch of different casts and, you know, a bunch of different hunts now, you know, we didn't didn't realize at the time how, uh, how amazing that was. Right. Um, just to, you know, have have that good of a hunt for our first experience with a with a competition hunt you know everybody talks about the good old days i i hear this all the time what about the good old days where have all the good old days gone you know and and we forget about the poverty in the old days and the hardship of the old days well my story about the old days my first cast back in the early 1980s i wasn't even born yet (laughs) thanks thanks kenny appreciate it (laughs) I'm going to say it, but, uh, yeah, since he did, I wasn't either. Well, my first cast in the early 1980s, it was a cross between, like, WWE wrestling and, the like, the the pre-fight stuff where you get in each other's face and try to intimidate. And at one time, I thought it was going to turn into – I thought it was going to turn into a real fight. And uh, it was was pretty brutal. I was a 13-year-old kid, and I didn't know what to do. I was like – what in the world is going on here? So we always talk about the good old days, and that was pretty commonplace back in the good old days. You know, there aren't too many people anymore that that uh, uh, have those kind of stories. So, yeah, and that's I mean that's a good thing. I mean, you can go out and you can you can be a you know be a decent sportsman like person, and you know just call your dog for what it is, and yeah, you know, they're they're I'm not, there to have fun. Yeah, we're out there to have fun. You know, they're they're not going to do everything perfect. You're not going to do everything perfect as a handler, but well, to the credit of the it, registries, they have learned how to handle that much better since that time. I mean, the the rules are very well defined. The use of panels, uh, they're not afraid to take disciplinary action for misconduct. Um, you know, so so on that front, that is why it's gotten better. Is because the registries knew that if it was going to survive that it had to be it couldn't be it couldn't be a, a brawl on every cast you know it just wasn't going to happen so right so yeah that's that's good stuff so um tell me about the hounds you got now what are you guys hunting these days oh you want you want to take that one Kenny? um well my favorite well no i can't really say my favorite uh he's my boy a catfish um He's the he's the one that we 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 first started with a pup, you know. Uh, what's his What's his name? Kenny? Doing, he's catfish, Appalachian blue catfish. Okay. Yep. I named him at a time when I was doing a lot of fishing. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> and uh, but I don't know. He's my rock. He's my he's Mister Reliable. If if I if I'm if I'm going to the woods and I definitely want to see some eyes or you know some fur that night. He's he and I gotta rely. He he's the one I'm putting. I'm loading in the dog box. Mm-hmm. Um, we also got Luna. She's a sweetheart. Oh man. Well, tell us a little bit more uh, about Catfish first. What what kind of dog is he? What do, you know? He, he, I assume he's a blue tick. Yeah. And how's yeah. how's he bred? Uh, he's out of Hagerman Smoking Blue Jake. Okay. And uh, Blue Label Two Bit Lucy. Yep. Yep. Yeah, um, we went. We drove out to Ohio to go get them. Um, funny thing is, like you hear all these people spend all these money on dogs. <laughs> uh, the guy sold them to us for one hundred fifty dollars, and he came with a box of twenty-two shells. <laughs> In case he didn't work out, or <laughs> I don't know. What the, I don't know what the twenty-two shells was, but I wasn't going to turn them down. You know, that was for shooting all those coons he was going to trade. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, the old joke is, you always keep one twenty-two bullet. You know, you keep it, keep it handy, <laughs> so you can show it to so yeah. you can show it to the dog every once in a while. Yeah, that's, um, one, that's one dog that would never need that. Yeah. So he, he came out of that. Was that <laughs> Nick? Nick? Nick Hagerman? Or what's his brother's yeah. name? Okay, Nick Hagerman. And uh, yeah, Greg, yeah, Greg Greg Hagerman, which is Nick's 
uncle yep. had Jake. Okay. Um, but yeah, Nick was hunting a half sister to catfish there for a while. Um, split shot. Split yeah. shot. Yeah. Yeah, they they went. Uh, they came to the uh, Peru quarterfinals the year we were hunting big country and jazz. Uh, at, okay. at the Peru quarterfinals, and uh, I think Nick got. I think Nick advanced. I think he went on. We got beat. I, yeah, it, would, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, he's, Nick's he's, usually he packing. Does pretty a, well with yeah, Nick's usually if he's if he shows up, he's packing a coon dog. That's for sure. Yeah, the, the he's first a hard time we met him. Yeah, the first time we met him was actually out at the World Hunt. Um, we had gone out. Catfish qualified for the show, and it was out in Illinois that year. And uh, we just, you know, we were still pretty early in us being into the to the hounds, and we figured, you know, we'll drive out and go just, just for the experience and, and see what it's like. Uh, we didn't have a dog qualified in the hunt. We showed, but then uh, we did hunt in the slam hunts a couple nights out there. But uh, Nick, Nick found us because he heard catfish barking, and uh, he sounds a lot like split shot apparently. So yeah. He, yeah, he, he like walked right on across the fairgrounds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What have you guys? Uh, what have you guys enjoyed about competition hunting? Meeting new people. Oh, yeah, I mean, you you meet people from all over the place, all all over the country. Um, you know, we've gone out to Automax the last few years. Like I said, we've been out to the World Hunt once. Um, you know, we've hunted in oh, probably at least six or eight different states with with our dogs. Um, but yeah, just, just traveling and, and meeting new people and, you know, just getting out in the woods and doing, doing what we like to do, doing what the dogs like to do. Yeah. Yeah. Then, you know, a lot of my friends, my, my friends are people that I've met along the way with these hounds. You know, a lot of my friends can qualify. And, uh, you know, I tell people all the time, if, if you, uh, if you, if you take advantage of that, I could leave here right now and travel to anywhere in the United States and probably not have to pay for a hotel room, you know, just places oh, yeah. that I could stop and my dogs are welcome there. I'm welcome there. And, um, I say that. And then, um, uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's pretty gratifying to think about, think about what value these hounds have added to my life and the experience and the value that it's that it's added there so pretty cool stuff hey i i jumped ship on us you guys were getting ready to tell me about a little female you're hunting i, I apologize let's go back to that <laughs> and you want hey, uh, you want to tell them about luna i can um yeah kenny did most of the hunting on uh on catfish and uh, i've done most of the, the hunting with luna handling her in the hunts and everything um i call her my luna love bug she's she's a sweetheart she just you know, she loves the attention. Um, we, we Apparently her mama loves the same way. Yeah. Yeah. And it, we have her in the house sometimes. She, she's out in the kennel right now, but when she's inside, she sleeps in bed under the covers. Oh, no kidding. She's, uh, yeah, she's, she's full of rotten. So, um, so how's she bred? She is out of Leon's dark side and um, Mike Shepard's northern blue Abbey dog. Yep, yep. Um, I've hunted with Abby, and I know Mike. Yeah. And uh, okay, I, hunted yeah. with, I hunted with Leon when uh, Mike had him had him out this way. Uh, I was probably okay, it's probably Leon. when Mike brought uh, what what they call him. It's not Leon. It's what it, I don't know. Leon's dark side. Mike actually. Yeah, Leon's dark side. They call him Leon. Yeah. They had him. Mike brought him back to Indiana and kept him for a few weeks while uh, Abby was okay. coming in. So I think I got to hunt That's, with him then. Yeah, that might have been might have been that litter because Luna Luna will be four this year. I think I, maybe I didn't hunt with him. I can't remember for sure. I either hunted with him there okay. at Greencastle, uh, the the okay. zone or the finals were at Greencastle, and and I saw him out that out that way. Yeah, he, yeah, Leon's, Leon's been around. Actually, yep. Yeah, and he's actually pretty local to us. Yeah, he um, is. Yeah, Paul Paul Kronauer, the the guy that owns him, he only lives about an hour and a half north of us. Yeah, Pennsylvania, uh, right? So he, you know, he, yeah. So he, you know, he comes to our local club, you know, every now and then with him. Um, I know he's gotten him qualified for the world. I think every year except the year he was a pup. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, out of out of she's out of Leon and, and Abby, uh, and we we enjoy hunting with Mike. We started a couple years ago when we when we really started hunting Luna, and getting her going. 
the first night we're out at Automix, that first night or two, when there's not any of the, you know, the official hunt going on, right. we usually drive a couple hours to Mike's house and go pleasure hunt with Mike. Um, cause he's, you know, he's just a great guy and, and we enjoy hunting with him and, um, down at Paragon, I think this Paragon, yeah, Indiana. Yeah. yeah I think yep. this, this past year we went out with Mike and, and pumpkin and we took Luna and we, we had a good time. Yeah. Mike, Mike lives in a great place to hunt over there. That's kind of, kind of my old stomping grounds where I, I started, uh, He's not too far from Ace Coon Club. He's not too far from the Green Castle Club. Uh, Johnson mm-hmm. County Coon Hunters had a club at that time that we hunted in there. So, you know, Mike, Mike and I have known each other for a number of years. I've seen him around. And, and uh, yeah, kind of a hotbed for coon hound activity. Yeah. So, yeah, so Luna goes back to, you know, Dancer and Pies On and um... – you know, then on on Abby's side, she goes back to to Bullet and Rattler. So we you know, we really like that that breeding, that Python breeding, and that Bullet and Rattler. Mm-hmm. So you know, we're we're kind of excited about her. She's she was a little bit slower to start. Catfish was the total opposite. He was he was too easy. He spoiled us. Yeah, he, <laughs> yeah, he spoiled us for for our first pup. He really spoiled us. Uh, he was he was running in tree and coon on his own right around a year old. Um, you know, co- completely by himself. Uh, now Luna, she was. Which it doesn't sound like much, but we don't have the coon population like a lot of people do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah if you if you treat if you treat two coon in a competition on here, you're doing pretty good. Right. Um, you're gonna be a cast winner. Winner, winner, yeah, chicken have, dinner. Have, two coons. Yeah, we don't <laughs> have the farms. We've got yeah, we're hunting mostly wooded creek bottoms. Um, we've got a lot of state ground around us. Um, we can be a pile. Oh, within an hour or so drive, we can hunt a couple hundred thousand acres of state ground. Is it state ground or is um, it national forest? In state. Maryland, it's state ground. Um, the the Mon National Forest in West Virginia is not too far from us too, yeah. but we we haven't hunted there. It's it's about an hour south from us. Okay, um, we squirrel hunted it. Yeah, we did. We did squirrel hunt part of it for a competition hunt once. I bear but, I bear um, hunt the yeah, so, bear hunt the western side of the the Monongahela. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the same country. But, We're not uh, too far away from each other, really. You know what? Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, that's not too far at all. Yep. Yep. So, uh, have you guys have you got put titles on those dogs, or what's the status there? Yeah, cat, catfish is a, a night champion. Grand Field Champion and Grand Show Champion, and he's got his HTX title. Um, you know that HT that HTX Luna, title. I think it is probably to me. I was really excited when they introduced that H- HTX title. Um, oh yeah, I think more people need to do it. It is, in my opinion, the most. It is the best way to measure the actual ability of the hound you know uh, not i've played the game enough and i'll argue with anybody about it so i'm i'll just say it on the podcast you know it there is a lot of handler influence on yes. the winner winner yes. of a cast and that has nothing to do with the ability of the dog a lot of times it, you're always going to be more successful i don't care and i'll argue this point you will always be more successful with a coon hound that trees real live raccoons that is always going to be your best bet. But, um, you know, the handler can have a lot of influence on the outcome of a cast. With an HTX, you've got a certain amount of time. You go out there, your dog, you know, you can't have too many faults. And he tree, they tree a raccoon or they don't. That's it. Yeah. yeah it's either and they don't get not. no help from anybody else. Exactly. There's no other dogs to, to piggyback on. There's no no other dogs to pitch your dog on. Uh, any of that stuff. The dog's got to go out there, strike a coon, tree a raccoon, and not get disqualified on faults. Mm-hmm. Three times. Absolutely. That's all it is. You know, that's that's it. That's that's the measure of a hound right there. Yeah, and there's there's not a whole lot of clubs that you are know, really offering those, those HTX hunts, and I I know it's difficult because you know. A lot of times you might need, you know, a lot more guides than you normally would for a regular hunt. You know, if you've got 
10 people that show up, those 10 people all have to hunt, you know, yep. individually. Yep. Um, so you've either got, you know, a group going out and they're just turning one dog loose at a time and they're out there for you know, a couple hours, or you've got a guy that's got to keep coming back and, you know, switching out hunters, uh, if you, you know, if you get a bunch of people show up, but, um, uh, yeah, I, I do wish it's something that more, more places would do. Cause you know, like you said, I mean, that, that measures the dog to me, you know, more so than anything else to say that this dog can go out and, and tree its own coon from, from start to finish. I got a pass with my jazz female. It was actually Mike, Mike Shepard was the judge. We hunted together that night and, uh, okay. it was, it was ridiculous is what it was. <laughs> So we go, we go to the first, we go to this a spot that Mike, I, I know this place is a, a coon woods. There's no doubt. But so we, Jazz got across the river and then she ran the coon down on this bank and she ran it into the bank, under the bank. And then she left out and she, she was staying on that hole. So I had to go down there and get her out of the hole. And then I pitched her again and she got in a brush pile. Okay. Oh. Yeah. So she's, and she wasn't really treeing in it. She was just trying to work through this huge, massive bulldozer pile at the end of the end of a farm field. So we were down to inside of 50 minutes. And this dog, this jazz started treeing coons when she's five months old. She's already, she's either a night champion with three wins towards grand or something. But I mean, an HTX shouldn't have been a big deal over Paragon. And my dog acted like she had never even been coon hunting before. And we're 55, 55 minutes into it. And she finally loads up on a tree and has a coon at 55 minutes into this whole thing. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. Sounds like catfish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So, oh, wow. have you done Catfish has always been pretty popular for doing that to us. They always will, that's for sure. So, have you guys been hunting Luna any? Are you guys doing anything, any competition hunting with her? Or how old is Oh, uh, yeah, we have some. Um, she'll be four this, this summer, actually, here next week, she'll be four. Okay. Um, and I, I've put four wins on her towards night champion, so she needs one more. Um, but we haven't, you know, we haven't been able to go into any hunts lately with the, you know, a lot of them have gotten canceled with the coronavirus. Right. Um, we were supposed to have RQE this weekend. Did, are they going to have yeah, it? We were supposed to have an RQE Saturday. No, we had Mar- Maryland is a lot more restrictive yet than other surrounding states. Um, Pennsylvania and West Virginia have started having a little bit more hunts, uh, but Maryland they they've still had it locked down to the point where I think we might be okay for our June hunt, but we'll, we'll see. I'm just, pr- I'm pretty uh, much had- over it. I'm not going to make this a political, political podcast, but somebody threw a pandemic and nobody showed up. If you ask me. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I get what you're saying. Gee whiz. We've, we've anyway, let's, I've yet to been in a store since they started this mask stuff. Are you guys required to wear masks out there? Yeah. If you go into a, if you go into a mask. store. Yeah. Yep. Oh my goodness, we aren't, we haven't gotten there yet in Indiana. We're actually opening everything up. I, and... I send the wipe in for my sodas. You do? Yeah. What do you say? <laughs> I send the wipe in the store for my sodas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he makes me go. Nice, Kenny. <laughs> well, that's that'll lead us in. We'll get to marital advice here in a little bit. <laughs> the keys to a happy marriage. <laughs> uh, so uh, you guys, you guys do a lot of hunting together. Tell us, tell us what other types of things you two do together. I mean, I see it on social media, and I know you guys each killed your first turkeys this year, right? Yeah, I mean we we've kind of dabbled in in turkey hunting over the last several years, uh, but this year was the first year we got real serious with it. Um, you know, mainly because a lot of the hunts around us are gearing up in the spring and, you know, it's kind of hard to be out until three o'clock in the morning and then go home and take an hour nap and go turkey hunting. Um, but since there weren't really any hunts going on this year, we decided we were going to be a little bit more serious about, about turkey hunting. And, uh, we went out pretty much every Saturday and Sunday, the first two or three weeks of the season. And then, um, I think it was May 3rd, we, we finally connected on a couple birds. Um, it was, it, it's definitely been an interesting season. Um, 
Kenny got attacked by a bobcat while we were turkey hunting one day. Let's tell that story. That's what we need to hear. Because I've just seen bits and pieces of this. So. Well, I didn't tell that. <laughs> well, where we were at, uh, you know, we were sitting maybe, what, you think 15, 20 yards apart? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I had my back up to a tree, and I'm kind of angled towards her, and she's kind of the same way, kind of angled towards me. And we're looking down over the hill, and uh, we hear some coming. I mean, you know, I'm hitting the call, boo, you know, yeah. and they're coming in, they're coming in. We got some hens coming, and it, they're getting close enough to the point to where I'm working the mouth call now, right? Okay. And uh, yep. I don't work in the box call. I want, my, I want my hands on the gun. Right. And, uh, well... I didn't have my hands on the gun, and um, I was reaching. My wife, she, she, she surprised me with a turkey vest one day when I got home from work. So that was pretty nice of her. But uh, I was like reaching my pocket there on the side, and I'm trying to put this box call in this pocket. Hey Kenny, and hey, uh, Kenny, you know, if you if you go into the store yeah. and get her sodas, you might get a new shotgun out of the deal. <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. That might be that might be pushing it a little bit. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> It would be the first time she's gotten me a gun. Oh, nice. All right, so so you're t- calling these turkeys. They're coming up. The, the I mean, they're they're on a are they on a rope coming to you? Or are they you can feel them coming? Where are we? They're at? they're down in they're down in the creek bottom. Um, we can't see them. Uh, there's a lot of brush down below us. Um, we're like on the edge of. There's a bunch of berries behind me. It's real thick. Like I recently gotten cut, and it's just overgrown, and. Uh, it's, it's right behind me, and I'm just sitting there, and I'm like, I'm reaching in my pocket, this pocket on my side that I can't really feel because I got gloves on, and I hate wearing gloves, and I'm reaching in that pocket, and I don't know if it's something that caught the eye or whatever, and I, like, I just happen to look down, and I'm looking, and I'm trying to figure out where that pocket is, and I heard something behind me go, Shh, like, leaves real quick, yep. and just as I look up, that cat's face is, is right in my face, like, I guess the Shh, was them, like, leaping, I don't know. I didn't catch that part, but I just as soon as I looked up, we made eye contact, and my first reaction was, I just punched it. You punched <laughs> I like punched the it right in the chest, and yeah, I hit it as hard as I could in my chest, but in its chest. But I was, you know, it was with my left arm, and it would be kind of behind me, so it wasn't a real good hit. So it was like throwing a baseball left-handed. Did... It was kind of like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, trying to punch. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I got you. I yeah, got you. Uh, yeah, and. uh like turn my I was wearing a hood so I guess maybe that's why I didn't get too scratched up I, I think he was more I think he realized as soon as he realized mid pounce that it was a mistake I, I guess yeah absolutely because <laughs> one paw one paw like hit me in my cheek and came oh, down no my kidding. neck yeah he... the other paw like hit me on my shoulder and I definitely felt pads and I felt the claws but they they were more retracted yeah. you know like he wasn't Good thing. I guess he was more like trying to back up, you know, right. like you know, uh, <laughs> when I hit it, all I could think was like, all right, now where's the gun? And I like fell down to my side and I grabbed the gun. I swung around. And by the time I got swung around, I saw his like rear end and he was looked like he was circling back around the tree. And I was like, no, you ain't going to get me on the other side. So I leaned back up real quick and tried to like my eyes on him to make sure. And he was just, back down into the bushes i don't know anybody that's got mauled by a bobcat until now <laughs> well <laughs> well i was kind of disappointed i didn't i didn't really get mauled you know it's kind of cool to have some scratches to tell about you know i did get a little tiny scratch on my shoulder yeah anything you get like a ta- tattoo gone. around or anything or is it just gonna leave it is it gonna leave a scar or anything <laughs> <No>. <laughs> i don't know <laughs> that's a pretty cool story so you guys, you guys end up, you guys end up killing turkeys this year. I saw some pictures of you. You guys had smoked turkey legs. Go ahead and just tell me about those smoked turkey legs right now. Well, I mean, it was just kind of something I wanted to try. Um, we decided since they were, they were both Jake, so you know, younger birds. So we figured we'd we'd pluck the whole birds and and part them out and use as much of it as we could. You know, a lot of people just cut the breast meat out and and kind of forget the rest. Right. Uh, but we we decided we were gonna keep everything. So um, we even the hearts. Yeah, even the hearts. Um, yeah. 
we we pickled we pickled those. Kenny just finished off the last of those tonight. Um, but we uh, yeah, we we saved everything, parted it out. So you know, I took these turkey legs and I kind of I used a a blueberry barbecue sauce uh, that I bought from a, a local place that that makes their own barbecue sauce, and uh, just yeah, threw them in the smoker for a couple hours and. Uh, that was the first time I'd ever smoked wild turkey. It came out a little bit on the dry side, but uh, but it was all right. Um, a lot of tendons in those drumsticks, aren't there? Oh yeah, yeah. I was I was kind of surprised. Um, yeah, like I said, this is the first I'd ever I'd ever cooked wild turkey. So yeah. It's we, we've got two birds to practice on. So so t- this is what I do with my this is what I do with my wild turkeys. So um, the breast meat, of course, gets I take it all. You know, I do the same thing. I I, Mm -hmm. take the breast meat. No waste. Nope. Flay it out. You know, gizzards, livers, you know, the whole thing. I like livers and gizzards, so uh, eat it all. But the breast meat comes out, and then the wings and the thighs and the drumsticks, you know, and I skin them. I go ahead and skin them out, and then I put the thighs, drumsticks, and wings in uh, a crock pot. And you can actually do, like, one half, one side at a time in the crock pot, cook it all the way down, and debone it get the tendons out of it throw some noodles in there and make some of the best turkey and noodles you ever had it's awesome all yeah. dark hey, meat that's... sweet <laughs> hey hun hey hun tell them what you uh made with one of the turkey breasts oh you're gonna make fun of me because i can never say it right <laughs> <laughs> what is it we, we did turkey schnitzel oh um <laughs> Turkey I, I used to have a terrible time. I used to have a terrible time saying that. I've gotten better at it. I think she's been practicing. She she knew you were going to ask during the podcast tonight. Yeah, <laughs> I practiced that all day. <laughs> oh, well, it's, it is obvious that you guys spend a lot of time in the woods together. Uh, before we before we get too deep, I really do want to talk about ramps. Tell us about tell us about uh, Joker, your mountain feist. That little dude looks cool. Oh. Uh, I'm a squirrel dog guy from way back. Had original mountain curs. We had a mountain feist that we kept that we kept for. Man, I think that little dude lived huh. to be 17 years old. Uh, oh wow! Love having a having a small terrier dog like that. I didn't really enjoy our mountain feist, um, but I've been around a lot of mountain feists that I really did like. Yeah, well, um, one of the clubs not too far from us that that we're also members of, um, just across the line in Pennsylvania. They started having the WTDA, which is just a different registry, World Tree Dog Association. Yep. Um, so they started having these WTDA squirrel hunts. And um, Kenny went along and spectated on a couple of those casts just to, to check it out. And he said, hey, I, I think we need to get us a squirrel dog. This is this is pretty fun. You know, it's something, you know, do in the daytime. And, um, you know, our squirrel season here starts in September and runs till the end of February. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's it's a pretty long season, too, You just like our, our coon season. And uh, so we started looking into it and uh, talked to some folks about, you know, different different types of squirrel dogs, you know, curs versus feist and and uh, and that sort of thing. And the the feist just seemed to be what we were looking for a little bit more. We wanted a dog that, you know, didn't didn't get real deep, you know, like you would with a with a coon or anything. We wanted a dog that generally hunts, you know, closer to us, and uh, more sight and sound. Feist. Yeah, yeah, more more sight and sound. It was just kind of in, intriguing how the the feist use their eyes and ears just as much, if not more so, than their nose. Mm-hmm. Um, so we found a breeder in um, like southwestern West Virginia, and um, we got a pup from him to start. Um, pretty much, most of the dogs we've had, except for that that first old female hound we had, we've we've started most everything else as pups. Mm-hmm. Um, we just we just prefer it that way. We don't mind putting the time in, and it's it's a lot more rewarding when you see that pay off and you see that switch flip in a young dog when they you know figure something out. And uh, it's 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 been a lot of fun with with joker um he's really he he just turned two and uh so his first season last year he was still pretty young yet 
and uh, I was actually kind of halfway worried about taking him to the woods because of how little he was. He only weighs about 22 pounds now, full grown. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So that, that yeah, first... scared a hawk might take him off. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that first squirrel season, he was he was still a real little guy. Yeah. But uh, this winter, this fall and winter, we've had him out. And uh, especially this spring is when he really started kicking it into high gear. And um, he was mostly running on sight and sound before, but he really started using his nose more. And he's, he's gotten pretty good at, at tree and squirrels. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, we've been taking him out when we've been going looking for mushrooms. We'll take him along. A lot of the places we've been going are on, you know, state property and there's, you know, there, there's dirt roads, but that's about it. There's nowhere that he's going to, you know, really get out and get into trouble or anything. Mm-hmm. So we take him along and, you know, as we're looking for mushrooms, about the time we say we're Joker go, you hear him off in the distance barking trees. Oh, oh, so, oh, 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 oh. He's a pretty yeah. good tree dog then. Oh yeah, he he kind of he kind of does a little little like double or triple bark. Right. And uh, how far away will he get he, from you? Generally, he stays within a couple hundred yards. Um, That's pretty good. He started, yeah, he started timbering squirrels pretty good. He'll watch them, and if if they leave, he'll he's he's gotten pretty good at following them. A C- couple um, hundred yards is yeah, a couple hundred yards is about the right range, in my opinion, for for a. For a squirrel dog, I mean, if they if squirrels are moving within two hundred yards, you can really get after some squirrels. And that's that's what we were looking for. We didn't want a dog, you know, gets real deep into the country. You know, we we do it for that coon hunt, and we kind of wanted the squirrel hunting to be, you know, something a little bit more relaxed and and laid back. And yeah. um, so he's, I'm, we're really excited for him this fall. Oh, you'll have a blast with him. They're so much fun. We had a. Uh, I had a little original mountain cur. He was a little yellow dog, uh, bobtail, just typical 45-pound mountain cur, and uh, hunting him a lot. I mean, traveled around with him, went to Albany, Georgia with him several years and hunted the uh, Southern Heritage Classic down there. But I remember, so we got these high-powered curs, you know. Me and a buddy of mine traveled down there, and we're hunting these plantations. Beautiful, beautiful places. We went back this on this one plantation and there's like kudu and zebra and giraffes. And I mean, this guy had all kinds of Hmm. exotic African stuff on the animals in high fence on this place. And uh, we're like, where have we gone to hunt? You know? And we keep, we keep (laughs) driving down these roads and, you know, you got these wildebeest running across, running off in the like, geez, old peach and keep going. You finally get to the river bottom and, uh, the guy we went with, he took his little feist with him, but he didn't even get him out of the truck. It was probably, I don't know, 1, one o'clock in the afternoon maybe. And, you know, we had these high-powered mountain curs, and we drove from Indiana, and we're hunting the Southern Heritage, and I won it last year, and blah, 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 and all this other stuff. And, and we worked our tails off to tree a few squirrels, and this guy got this little feist out. He called, called him Scoop about 30 minutes before dark, <laughs> and Scoop, Treed 13 squirrels in about 30 minutes and made those wow. big powerhouse curs look like culls. <laughs> <laughs> I think mine wanted to go over and run the kudu or something. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> Different yeah, environment for them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No. They're definitely, these fights are definitely a, a lot of fun, but that's where the term feisty came from. That's right. That's right. They are they're, super they're cool dogs. They're and... Oh yeah, ball of energy. They they think they're ten foot tall and bulletproof. You know they don't know they're yeah. twenty pounds. Yeah, Kenny Kenny calls him the terrorizer. Yeah, that's a good name for him. That's that's for sure. So, you guys uh, you guys plan on competition hunting him too, or what are you going to do with him? Yeah, we we have some. Um, you know, there's like I said, the one club that's pretty local to us has has a couple WTDA hunts a year. Uh, but most of the time for those, we're having to drive two or three hours to, to get to a squirrel hunt. Um, so do they divide so those up? Down at, I can't remember. Do they divide that up in class? Do they have a on height, so they hunt the curs, the curs together and the feist together, or do they hunt them all? Hounds, curs, feist all together. I can't remember. They, they'll divide them up. Okay. Um, you know, usually our, our local clubs only, only has a couple dogs anyway. I think um, – 
I don't know, the most we've usually drawn is about five dogs. Um, just because it's we're not a big squirrel dog country. Yeah. Now you get down to like Kentucky, Southern West Virginia, Ohio. There, there's a lot of squirrel dogs there, and a lot more clubs having the hunt. Um, Mm -hmm. But we took him, we took him out to Ohio for WTDA Grand Nationals in March. Uh, He didn't do that great in the hunt, but uh, he did win best male feist in the bench show. So we're we're pretty proud of him for that. He made bench champion in WTDA that day. He's a good but, uh, looking dude. We've we've got him registered in UKC too, so we've taken him to to feist days and mountain feist days and um you know, but again you're having to drive two or three or even more hours to, to get to pretty much every one of those if it's not at our local club. So we're, you know, we don't we don't get to as many of them as we'd like, but where are they have a mountain feist days at? Uh they they rotated it around the one year we went it was in london kentucky yep yep and uh we went to feist days in december that was out in mount orib ohio okay that's where the bogs creek bogs creek mountain feists are over in that country okay pretty sure that's where bogs creek comes from right there on yeah, mount orib greg champ uh, greg champ used to have hunts right there uh north of he lives right there north of Richmond in, uh, I'm going to say Deerfield, maybe. And it's in Indiana. And then uh, Mount okay. Orb's not too far away. And, and uh, I forget the guy's name that had those Boggs Creek dogs. He was a big-time National Current Feist Breeder Association. The, their annual meeting is held at um, Elnora, Indiana. Used to be a huge event. I mean, huge. There were... The hunt would have a hundred dogs in it. Oh wow! Yeah, I mean, if and so I'm not even sure. That's when Claude Claude Thomas was still alive, and he was he was running it. I don't know what the status is with it anymore. But National Current Feist Breeder Association was as fun of time as you could have with a dog or with your clothes on. It was just it was a whole lot of fun. We had a blast over there. <laughs> So we go over and camp and yeah. and just have a have a good weekend. Yeah, and that's you know the the folks we've met with the squirrel dogs. I mean, they've been you know very very welcoming, very personable personable group of folks. You know, willing to, to help you out, give you advice. Um, it's you know it's kind of a whole new thing with us. It's something that we're not you know we've been in the hounds for a few years now, but you know we've only had the the squirrel dog you know like i said he just turned two and we've had him since he was a pup so you know just the, the last couple years here yeah yeah well hey let's shift gears a little bit we got to talk about ramps before we wrap this up we'll wrap it up with ramps and and uh a couple other things but <laughs> so most people unless you're from i i would say that most people don't have a clue what a ramp is you guys tell us what yeah. tell us what a ramp is if if you're not from around Appalachia somewhere, you probably don't know what a ramp is. Um, so it's it's a wild leak. Uh, so kind of like an onion, but not not quite. Um, it it gets a bulb on it like an onion does, and it's got two to three broad leaves, and they're only up for a short time in the spring. Uh, around here, generally, we're able to dig them from mid-April until I just dug what I think is going to be the last of them for this year, the other the other evening. Mm-hmm. Um, and they grow in, um, they tend to grow in patches, moist, fertile soil generally. Uh, you know, we find them a lot. Along they're like the, the first green yeah. thing too. Yeah. 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 yeah they're, they're one of the first green things you're going to, you're going to see in the spring before there's any leaves on the trees, before the grass really starts greening up, you'll, you'll start seeing the ramp. Um, and, uh, they have a flavor that's kind of like in between garlic and an onion. That's what I was getting ready uh, to say. Like, it's a cross between garlic yeah. and onion. They're, they're like an onion with a little bit of extra bite. Yep. Yep. And if you eat a lot of them, everyone else around you will know. That's it. exactly right. Uh, you sweat it. Yep. You sweat them. <laughs> yeah, it's it's going to come out in your People at work complain about it. Uh, about you? 
Yeah. yeah, because you're using that ramp. You guys, you guys do all kinds of crazy stuff with ramps. So you're pickling them. Oh yeah. You're putting them in. You're cutting them yeah, up and I, using them like garlic. You're grinding the leaves up. Tell us all the things you do with them. Just, I just pickled some today, and um, later in the season when the bulbs are bigger is is when they're really good for pickling. Um, you know, they get a little bit more flavor to them, and it doesn't take quite as many to to fill a jar. Mm-hmm. But I just I just do a basic pickle brine. You have vinegar, water, sugar, salt, and and some pickling spices, and it makes a nice you know spicy pickled onion kind of flavor. Um, Kenny really likes the salsa. I make salsa with them, um, just using fresh ramps. Crushed, yeah, fresh ramps chopped up. And you can eat the whole thing. You can eat the the bulb. You can eat the stem. You can eat the leaves. Yeah. So I'll you know chop up several whole ramps and and throw them in a batch of of homemade salsa. And that's that's Kenny's favorite. I had to make twice as much this year, so so he has enough to last until next year. <laughs> uh, so where do you where do you work, Kenny? And what what kind of proximity are your coworkers have? You're not like a team truck driving cross country or anything like that, right? <laughs> nah, nah, um, um, we work on we build houses yeah. so we're always in tight confinement to, with each other i hear you yep and we can smell the ramps <laughs> yeah oh man that's that's great stuff you're gonna have to send me your recipe for pickled ramps okay i can do that yeah because we uh we actually ha- where I live, I live in southeastern Indiana, okay? I live, I, I look at the Ohio River every day. I look at Kentucky every day. So we're actually okay. the foothills of the Appalachians right here. And uh, so we get a lot of ramps. We get a lot of the same same things here. I actually discovered yeah. ramps a few years ago and, and love them. They're great. But even people around here don't know what they are. Oh, no. And She's even not- been drying the leaves and... Making a ramp dust. I know. What do you do? What are you doing with that? So, um, I just kind of like, use it. I, oh, go ahead. Well, no, go ahead. You're oh, the cook. Well, <laughs> I just oh, eat. yeah, I'm the cook. Okay, I'll, I'll, moder- <laughs> I'll moderate here. Melissa, go I'm ahead. <laughs> um, so, yeah, what I do is I'll take the, the, the leaf portion, um, especially off of a lot of the ramps that I pickle, you know, especially earlier in the season. And I'll put them in the dehydrator until they're completely dry and then run them through a, a food processor and grind them up till they're almost like an oregano type texture. Yeah. And uh, then I keep them in a little spice shaker jar and uh, you can use that all year. You know, just adds a little bit extra flavor to your potatoes or scrambled eggs or, you know, wh- whatever you happen to be making. It's amazing. That is awesome stuff. I'm as excited to talk to you about ramps as I am about all the dog stuff. <laughs> there's not a whole lot, of, like you said. There's not a whole lot of people that that know what ramps are. So it's. I was surprised Lauren knew what ramps were. She had a big mess of ramps that she found, and well, she's in hmm. Wisconsin. Yeah, right? she's in Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah. They hmm. they know that, and that's probably one of the. I mean, that's one of the places I know of outside of Appalachia where you can find them. I did. I didn't uh, have but, a clue yeah. when she was uh, when she said she had ramps. I figured she'd pull up somebody's tulip bulbs or something. <laughs> oh man that is just good stuff but seriously you send me that recipe and uh we'll post it on our patreon page i'll make a post out of it okay. on our patreon page and uh okay this is Na- melissa nash's pickle ramps or something we'll figure out something to yeah to call it. But that's cool stuff all right you guys got anything else you want to talk about before i ask you the the final zinger I got a couple questions I want to ask you to, to to close this thing out. Okay, go ahead. All right, so shooter. So the first question I have is, what is the most valuable advice that you've ever gotten since you started into hounds? Hmm. Oh, there's so much of it. Now you're going to make me think. Yeah. Yep. If you could, if you could think back to that one person or that, or you can, you can even talk about, you know, who influenced you the most and how they, you know, gave you, were a positive influence on you. 
I yeah, I would, let's let's go with the person that that influenced sure at least me the most. Probably. And um, oh, what were you gonna say, Kenny? I have a feeling we might say the same person. <laughs> a lot of the older club members that are no yeah. longer with us, they really took us under their wing, and we we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have had such a good start if it wasn't for them. So, yeah, especially our our old club president Steve. He uh, yeah, right away he invited us to come hunting with him. Um, you know, him and our our club, what was the vice president then and is the president now. You know, those Steve and Billy, they you know they took us out hunting. They you know were the first ones to teach us about you know if you're you know if you're in competition hunting, here's how this works, here's how that works. Um, you know, we're always there to, you know, give advice if you needed it. And, um, you know, we, we still, you know, Billy's still the president of our club now, but we lost, we lost Steve about two years ago. Um, yeah. And that, that, that was a great loss for our club. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, you know, he had been in hounds a long time. Um, he's know, a Lone Pine he, guy. Oh, no yeah, kidding. He, he grew up on, he grew up hunting dogs for Gene Harrison. Okay. Yep. And uh, he just, you know, he just had so many years of, of knowledge. And, uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of nights when we've said, I mean, I wish we could still go hunting with Steve. Right. As much as he ragged on us about getting blue ticks, I think he really liked catfish. <laughs> he was... He was with us when Catfish really started clicking, and he had just the biggest smile on his face as I did. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but he picked on us all the time. Well, sure. They always. <laughs> it, the only thing, the only th way you get picked up, picked on more than hunting a blue tick is if you hunt a plot. I can promise you that. <laughs> yeah. So, and I hunt. He's I hunt not both. Even here to defend himself. I hunt both. I've got, I've got plots and blue ticks, so I'm double. It's crazy. I don't know. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, good stuff. All right, here's the other. Got the black and blue action. I do. Yeah, actually, I always <laughs> figure my walk-down song, if I ever if I ever had a walk-down song, you know, it'd be Blue on Black by uh, Kenny, w <laughs> Kenny yeah. Wayne Shelton. Blue on Black. But, uh, so, how long have you been married? Oh, uh, this year will be eight years. Eight years. Okay. So, what have what kind of marital advi marital advice would you give our listeners? I I always tell everybody I married my best friend. Um, you know, we we had a good many of the same interests. You know, starting out when we met each other, you know, ten, eleven years ago, and we've gotten into a lot of things together. Yeah, and. You know, ev you know, everything we've done, you know, whether we know how to do it or not, if we don't know how to do it, it's like, well, let's try it and figure it out. Figure it out. Um, you know, like mushroom hunting. We, you know, we used to get morels that just kind of grew in our yard, but this year, you know, we've been, we've been kind of going out and, and actually searching and, you know, reading up on where to find them. And, and we've, we've been pretty, pretty successful with it. So just, you know, trying and, and bounce ideas off of each other of how to, how to do something better. Um, we're, we're a team, but it's still a competition. That's I was going to ask. Yeah. I was going to ask for your, <laughs> your opinion, Kenny, cause you've got, so you've got your Kenny, Kenny Nash's recipe for marital bliss. What is it? Have, you gotta have fun. I mean, you gotta you gotta enjoy it. Uh, not everything's perfect, but you know, you got you gotta know you gotta have the same interest. You know, uh, you gotta pick up where the other one left off, leaves off. You know, mm -hmm. uh, where I fail, she does really good, like phone conversations. <laughs> <laughs> you've got to compliment. She's definitely more on the peak. You've got to compliment each other. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay, I got yes. you. Yes, she's definitely uh, more on the PR side of things than I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we've been my wife and I have been married for 25 years, and she has hunted with me a few times. But uh, I always tell everybody the reason she was smiling so big when she came down the aisle is because she knew she would never have to hunt with me again. <laughs> 
Yep. She's like, I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine if she didn't want to hunt with me all the time. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I have different friends over the years, of course, and some of them have really, I've got really two really good friends and they've hunted together their entire, entire marriage. Uh, matter of fact, their first, their first date was a fox hunt. Uh, they went, call them foxes and they've, they've been hunting together ever since. And then I've got other, other friends that their wives and they just don't like to mix the two, you know, that, that just, you have your time. I have my time, but at the end of, we come together, you know, that type of thing. So it's always interesting, yeah. always interesting. And there's no arguments when you got to drive nine hours, go to a hunt somewhere. It's like, okay, I'll pack up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. There are times like when I hit the road and head west, I, I would love to have my wife with me on those on those long road trips, you know, to keep me company. And and uh, but it's just not her thing. And oh, and even to just switch off driving, you know, when you're coming back from a hunt and you know, you're tired and just you know ready to be home, but you still have a couple hours yet to go. That's right. That's right. So, hey, I just want to tell you guys, I applaud the teamwork that I see out of the two of you. And that's, that's why I wanted to have you on the podcast. Besides the fact that you guys have been great supporters of Houndsman XP, we really do appreciate you. And, uh, but I want to celebrate, I want to celebrate the relationship you two have. You guys, you guys are doing things right. And you can see, yeah, we're we're in it together. Good stuff. Good stuff. (laughs) Well, Hey, we have a way of closing out this podcast every week and you guys are, probably have you listened to every one of, have you listened to every single podcast yeah yes. both of us have all right well you close you close the podcast out all right well thanks for having us on chris and you follow your hounds and we'll follow ours all right sounds good you almost nailed it you follow your hounds and i'll follow mine <laughs> well i figured we're a team we're a team we gotta follow ours <laughs> I, I will accept that, Melissa. I knew exactly where you were headed with that, and it, it passed. 